Welcome to ASRS's Journal of Vitreoretinal Diseases Authors Forum. I'm your host, Dr. Timothy Murray, Editor-in-Chief of JVRD. On each episode of the JVRD Authors Forum, I will interview innovative retinal researchers on their studies featured only in JVRD and how these studies will impact our patients' care in our clinics. Tune in to hear directly from investigators about the clinical implications of the newest and highest quality research in the field of retina. Welcome to the JVRD Author Forum. I'm joined today by Dr. Carolyn O, oh, who is going to present a unique case of fungal endophthalmitis with more details in our upcoming JVRD issue. Welcome, Carolyn. Thank you so much, Dr. Murray, for having me. This is so fun to be here. So fun to have you here. Um, can you tell me a little bit about uh, this case, which is yeah. unique? Just to give an overview, I guess, of what the case was. It's a patient that we saw at the Coli Institute. Um, she had a bad case of Aspergillus terius endophthalmitis, which is a rare fungal species, complicated by the fact that she was currently being treated with systemic and local steroids for a concurrent systemic sarcoid. So we presented this case for two reasons. One, to really highlight the very aggressive nature of Aspergillus terius. We include in our case report a review of the literature of previously 22 reported cases and treatments and outcomes. So that was the first thing really to highlight how aggressive with poor outcomes these patients have. And secondly, to kind of focus on um, you know, we hear it again and again, but maintaining a high suspicion for infection in a setting of known um, other inflammatory conditions. Right. So I think, I think we all hear about our patients that are immunocompromised, and it mm -hmm. so broadly applies now to, to many of our patients for a variety of different mm -hmm. reasons. Mm -hmm. So how did this patient present, and, and, and even with that high suspicion, um, this is such an unusual organism. Mm -hmm. Take me through the presentation and, and the recognition. Sure. So her ocular history extends pretty far back from when we actually first saw her. So eight months prior, she had been treated, uh, she presented to an outside ophthalmologist with decreased vision in one of her eyes. Um, she had a 30-year biopsy-proven history of sarcoidosis with a history of ocular flares. Um, so eight months prior, with decreased vision, she was known to have inflammation, was treated with oral and topical steroids that actually really helped her. She said, oh, it got almost completely better. But about it, isn't that interesting, though, that, you know, the steroids often make these patients transiently better? Yes. Well, that's actually true. But also in this case, we're not 100 percent sure if that couldn't have been a sarcoidosis flare. Um, you know, she was also having active pulmonary um, sarcoidosis and had her methotrexate increase to 25 milligrams daily. Um, she had, when we did a full workup, she had some bronchiectasis, some gastritis, just a lot of reasons in a lot of these sick patients um, that they might have areas or nidises of inflammation and infection that, that we're not sure of. Um, but I think that's true. It's possible that it was just so slow growing and responded well to the steroids. Temporarily. Exactly. So how does she get the coal? So she came to us for a second opinion. About a month prior, she had gotten a dexamethasone implant in her eye. That was because when trying to taper the steroids, the flare kept worsening again. So she had the dexamethasone implant and felt it was better, but just wanted a second opinion. Um, so she came to us at coal at that time, had minimal inflammation. She had trace AC cell, one plus vitritis, um, vision was 2040. She was feeling like things were better. She said, yes, things have been better after the implant, but I just wanted a second opinion. Um, so we proceeded to treat it as sarcoidosis, um, did get additional workup, TV, syphilis, CBC, CMP, kind of the basics, um, and had her come back a month later. When she came back a month later, she actually had said, you know what, it had been worsening this whole time for the last month, just gradually, but then one week ago, things exploded and now, now I can't see. And at that time, when she came back to us, her vision was hand motion from 2040 um, with really dense vitritis, a large on B scan, 11 by 15 by 15 um, millimeter um, large vitreous opacity. So just things had really gotten worse. Interesting that you're asking her to monitor her vision and vision is slowly worsening and suddenly worsening and still a delay until you see the patient. Exactly, exactly. So now things are a little extreme. Take me through your next steps. So at that point, there was kind of two thought processes. One, she does have this known sarcoidosis that can cause really bad intraocular inflammation, but also the presentation now, you can't exclude that it's 
you know, very suspicious for infectious. Um, neoplastic, I think, would be included on the differential, but we have to address the possible infection. So she actually went to the operating room for a diagnostic and therapeutic vitrectomy to clear all that debris and get a sample. Um, at that time, she was noted to have a large, sort of elevated round of retinal whitening, um, which was treated with intravitreal clindamycin at that time. So you're thinking potentially infectious, could be Toxo, a neoplastic process, it, mm -hmm. lots of things it could be. Um, what, were, what did you do ahead of time before you went to the OR to try to make sure you were going to be able to have an adequate specimen and it would be evaluated appropriately? Well, I think that based off of the dense vitritis she had in that large clump, I think it wasn't so much of a question if we were able to get that sample as long as they had access. Um, so once they had, you know, were able to into the eye and get the sample out, it was just a matter of sending that to the lab and hoping it would come back in an appropriate time frame that we could we could treat this. And she also then, pretty much immediately after the surgery, was admitted actually to our inpatient service at Cleveland Clinic to have a full infectious workup. Well, sometimes, you know, the, in that neoplastic process, we may be thinking lymphomatous disease too. And, and mm -hmm. a lot of times we find that it's helpful speaking to the pathologist mm -hmm. and to the microbiology team ahead of time to let them be aware right. potentially that you've got a specimen that may be unique. Right. I think that's true. And I think that definitely highlights sort of the multidisciplinary nature of a lot of these patients who are more complex. So how quickly did um, your specimen return with informative information? So quite slowly. Actually, initially it came back suspicious for Candida. Um, and interestingly enough, when she got in, when she was admitted, um, despite having had a thorough review of systems, reviewing outside hospital reports, um, she did actually admit that she had been treated one month prior um, with systemic antifungals for an esophageal candidiasis. So her initial cultures were kind of coming back to suspicious for Candida, but we actually didn't get finalized cultures on it until at least a week or two later. Mm -hmm. And so how did the management go? So you've you've got this rapidly fulminant process. You're yes. in the operating room. You admit your patient. Yes. Um, did you select some broad spectrum coverage initially? Yes. So infectious disease immediately became, became involved. She had a series. Basically, once this known esophageal candidiasis history became involved, she was ha hit with broad spec antifungals, um, IV, oral. We also, she, we also treated her with intravitreal um, voriconazole. So kind of immediately off the bat going the fungal route. And then take me through the course after you've instituted therapy. So, you know, this just highlights again the aggressive nature. It was a really poor course. Um, she had, um, despite, despite being hit hard with systemic antifungals and then repeat injections of voriconazole, or voriconazole, um, she was worsening. So she ended up getting injections of amphotericin B, was still worsening, had a repeat vitrectomy, um, more intravitreals, continued systemics. The infectious disease team was working to kind of alter what she was on, um, which the details in the case report are more of, you know, specifically the right. doses and what she was taking. Um, and ultimately, you know, when the when the speciation came back, Aspergillus teres, which is intrinsically resistant to amphotericin B. Um, and amphotericin B is what typically is used for Aspergillus species. Um, and so at that point, it's very difficult. Your hands are kind of tied with limited options. So she was getting um, intravitreal voriconazole after that, um, but really still worsening. And it was after really a couple months of um, systemic antifungals um, that things quieted down. And so right now, you know, it's actually been about a year and a half now, but she's NLP, unfortunately, but quiet eye, no pain. And remember, too, sometimes we worry about an, an endogenous dissemination where even the second eye can be involved. Mm -hmm. So I find, you know, you, you can't not be aggressive with the first right. eye. Right, requiring at least a month of, of systemic antifungals, if not more. But I think that's a really good point. We still don't know, and maybe you have more thoughts on where, where this even came from, where the fungus, you know, if it's an, we're assuming it's an endogenous spread, exogenous possibly from the dexamethasone, but a month, do you ever see a, like a month later having that exogenous response? So one of the things Dr. Flynn likes to focus on in these, these cases is they're, they're, they can be so atypical. And, and mm -hmm. what, I, what I love in your case report is that you have the thought process that takes you through keeping an awareness of what this could be. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that, that, that's really the key. And, and then aggressively managing. So right. I, I think that the, the case was, was well managed. It just highlights that, that these outcomes, you know, can be incredibly difficult for our patients. Mm -hmm, definitely. It was a, a great learning case for me and really working through 
how she could have gotten it, how patients can get these horrible infections, and what kind of, you know, as, we're, as physicians, what kind of systemic processes we should be thinking about and excluding. Well, it reminds us that we're not just the eye doctor. Exactly, exactly. Thank you for joining us. Excellent clinical case discussion, the full paper in JVRD, and I appreciate your being here, Dr. Up. Well, thank you so much for having me, Dr. Murray. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to the JVRD Authors Forum. You can watch and listen to more episodes on the ASRS YouTube channel and on popular podcast directories, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Visit www.asrs.org forward slash JVRD forum on the ASRS website to learn more. See you soon.